more entrepreneurs are going to become micro influencers of themselves. They need to do it. When I don't know who you are, I don't trust you. I can go Google you, but I don't see anything when I Google you. And if they're hoping that LinkedIn is going to be enough, it's not. It's not enough. Hey, co-founders. Welcome to My Second Million with Connor Tompkins, where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies. In this episode, Connor chats with Andrew Warner, a seasoned entrepreneur, podcaster, author, and founder of Mixergy. So without further ado, Andrew Warner. Can I tell you about the second million that we made? I think that's where we're going to start, right? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay, the second million was so much chiller than the first. The first, I had finally got a customer who was going to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars for co-reg. Co-reg is where someone signs up for your email newsletter and you say, well, would you like to sign up for this other newsletter? And even today, those co-reg deals go for like a buck. Newsletter publishers will pay you a dollar per subscriber if it's a good subscriber. We were getting roughly that, and I found a way to get a ton of registrations. It was when you're sending out a greeting card, I would say, hey, you're emailing a greeting card. Do you also want to get my newsletter, Andrew's newsletter? And people would say, yeah. And then I'd say, would you also want to get this other newsletter? And a significant number of people said yes to that too. And so we got hundreds of thousands of people within a month who signed up for this one client's newsletter. And I am paranoid. I think, they can't afford to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is a lot of money for them. And so I start to call them up to say, do you really have the budget for this? And I don't know who to talk to. And I'm in super paranoid mode because I had affiliates that I had to pay for. I break into a board meeting. And I didn't realize I was in a board meeting, but, they, but someone said, look, there's this guy who's calling and he's paranoid. Let's just talk to them. And so the CEO goes, hey, just put him in. So in the board meeting, he takes my call on speaker and I say, um, we have uh, um, $235,000 from last month and I'm really happy that you're a customer, but do you think it's something that you could, is it okay? Are you able to pay it? And he's like, yeah, it's not a problem, Andrew. Do, is anyone not paying you on time? And going, no. And he says, yeah, it's not a problem. I took a photo of that check and I sent it to my dad like, look, your son made it. And this company had raised millions and millions of dollars. Their valuation was based on how many registrations they got. They were able to monetize the hell out of each email registration. The dollar was not an issue. But then that got us to the million, that deal with them. And I was able to keep getting them more subscribers. And then once we hit the million, I felt entitled to the second one. I felt like, yeah, of course, maybe they should be paying me more. Who else should we be getting in? Who else should we allow to pay us? hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in order to buy co reg deals from us. And then I started to act with a different attitude, more bravado, more expectation. And that changed things. That allowed us to make the second one faster. I think there's like almost like an uncomfort or discomfort, right? Around mm -hmm. at like when you're first getting started around asking for money, receiving money, asking for permission to receive that money. And, and even just like What's the process we're going to use to get this? What's the machine going to look like? What's the process look like? So I knew I wanted to get into email newsletters in the beginning. I thought my genius idea for getting subscribers would work so well that we would be flooded with subscribers. So here's the deal. We had email newsletters and I would monetize it with advertising. I thought the way that I would get subscribers was I would offer 10 cents to a charity if somebody subscribes. So now people have an opportunity to support a charity that matters, but they don't have to take money out of their pockets. All they have to do is subscribe and this would be genius and people would think that I'm so caring. And I rolled it out. I started saying this and nobody cared. It was not a way to get subscribers. It was just such a bomb. So that part of the machine was a complete failure. You had this moment where you, you found essentially a client that was willing to back your play. And then you had this partnership initiative that you tried to launch with a nonprofit and it just didn't go your way. This part of the business, that's your first two million. Okay. I, I created like essentially an online greeting card. And when you sent the greeting card, there was a checkbox for you to sign up to my email newsletter. Then this guy, Alan Stein, I'm going to keep saying his name because I got to find out where he is. He's He was a good hustler in the newsletter business in the early days. He told me about how he had done Coleridge. And at first, I remember thinking, you're giving away your subscribers. What a mistake. Somebody signing up, you should have their full attention. And then I got desperate and I realized if I could get a dollar every time someone signs up, 
I bet we can make our stuff interesting enough to compete in the inbox with one other message from this customer who's paying us a dollar. And so I said, sure, let's do it. And so then the first part of the machine was greeting cards. The second part of the machine was co-reg. The third part was actually getting somebody to pay us for a co-reg. And then once we had that, then everything was in place. But it was a lot of agony to get to that. You essentially made your own little marketing flywheel and you're just trying to figure out what were those three points to get it going. And you were doing this early. co is now, if you know the Beehive platform, like the newsletter platform, yes. they now have it built into the yeah. platform. So you can just say, hey, I'm open to other people subscribing to newsletter X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to pay, I think now it's like $2.50 or something yeah. like that per subscriber. The one idea that I would have for this whole co business that exists today is to think outside the newsletter. There are plenty of things that people are doing today that they're using their email address for and a checkbox that says, do you also want to get this thing would work. I'll give you an example. I love writing with AI. I did a search yesterday on Google for tools that will let me write with AI. And like that Notion has it built in. I like that I can go to ChatGPT, but I want it in a lot of different places. And sure enough, there's a Chrome plugin that will let you write with AI. And I registered by putting my email address in. And then they said, okay, congratulations, you're in the free version and you should pay to get the next version if you like it. Can you imagine if instead of losing money on the free version or using it as just a hook that one day I might pay for his next version, monetized it instantly, what that would mean for his business? And how would he do that? Well, there are a few AI email newsletters that are doing well. Like I like the rundown. It's one of my favorite AI newsletters. Imagine if he said, while I'm signing up to this, do you also want to be aware of other AI tools? Check this box and we'll sign you up for an email newsletter that'll tell you about other AI tools. He's now making money from each new trial. And that to me is where people should be thinking. How do I get someone to subscribe to an email newsletter while they're doing something else? Can this apply to like short form video content where you're on TikTok and you're like, I want to follow Andrew or I want to follow this person. And then you hit that follow button. And then Andrew, you're like, hey, if you like me, you might want to follow like these people. Right. And then there's a chain that you start to develop because I I'm inside the space and I still don't know all the people I should be following. It would be nice to get some recommendations. I'll tell you where I think that there's more room for growth. I've been watching ConvertKit do the, this email ad platform, but I don't think that people are using newsletter email ads the way that they could be used. They're using them as just plain old ads. And what they should be aware of is you can actually pass along an email address in a link in an email. So imagine if I had an email newsletter and I said, if you like my email newsletter, you should read this other one that I read too. Here's what I like about it. Click here to sign up. They click and they automatically have their email address passed over into the, the next person's registration. And you could even set it up so as soon as they click, they're signed up. One click for sign up. I think that that's, that's helpful. Truthfully, it's not as useful as co-registration. It's not as big as co-registration. But I think that there are ways to do email that people are not doing yet. How do you think this is going to change as email's already getting kind of saturated? People are looking for more specific content. AI is going to help add to the proliferation. How do you think that that's going to change this space? After I sold that email and greeting card business, I remember talking with the founder of Goodreads, Otis. He was a friend and he was doing a little bit of email and he advised someone else to do email marketing. And I remember at the time saying, email is dead. We already exploited it. I thought we had already saturated email with our, with our greeting cards and with our trivia day and with our clients' email and others had done something similar. And I was wrong. That was a long time ago. I think we keep saying email is dead and it somehow survives. Hey, podcast listeners. Eight years ago, I started a company called Support Ninja. It's an international hiring, training, managing, outsourcing company to help you find the best talent anywhere. If you guys are interested in hiring international talent, check out supportninja.com. Cheers. I guess I should share really quick. So for my second million podcast, I had three companies that were of decent size and one of them completely blew up and that was called Delegate It. It was a mobile app concierge for Airbnb and VRBO rentals. And so it made money, but the issue is that it didn't make any profit. So even though it was generating like cash, it was leveraging these third party services at the time that weren't making any money. So I would say like Uber, Lyft at the time, like early DoorDash delivery, 
And so we have all these different properties around the United States that we were helping deliver groceries. So it was making money, but it wasn't successful. Wait, this is so for Airbnb to owners to delegate some of the purchases they need to maintain their Airbnb? No, this is on the other side. So this is for the guests that are arriving. And so at the time, we were a group of students and Magic had come out, this like kind of like text to get anything yeah. kind of platform, right? And I was like, this is so magical. Like, it's so easy to set up. The barrier to entry is like something that a college student could possibly do. And so I walked around campus trying to find a bunch of like developers and other entrepreneurs that were interested in starting this next thing. I was all hyped up on our own, our own excitement, right? That we're going to build this one app that's going to consolidate everything. And we found out that it wasn't niche specific enough. We wrote all these lines of code. Like we had a web app, we had a mobile app. What back when that was really hard to do is omni-channel support, like before Zendesk was doing omni-channel. And we built this like massive thing to do a very simple thing that wasn't generating profit on top of these subservices, essentially. Okay. All right. Yeah. It wasn't, it was a little rough. We were getting these requests for these people that were staying at these properties. And well, we decided to niche down and focus on, on Airbnbs. And we're like, we know when people are arriving because we had access to like the API on the back end, we can send you a text and pick you up from the airport. And so we were like delivering lanyards for like a conference in, on, in New York. We were like helping people get these things on the fly. And we were having these people called delegators like pull over on the side of the highway and try to fulfill requests. So I feel like this, this doesn't count, but this is like my, my second meal, million failed okay. edition. <laughs> the one that actually worked was Embark and it was a dog genetics company. And essentially we built a, a box and it had a swab inside of it. You, we would send it to Illumina for genetic processing. Adam Boyko and Ryan Boyko were two brothers. Um, Adam was a professor of dog genetics at Cornell. And we made this chip that processed a lot of genetic information. And we were on Good Morning America and we sold out boxes like incredibly fast. And so that was the second. How big did that get? So I would say that they're in probably mid nine figures as far as like revenue. Wow. And they raised money with SoftBank two years ago, a $750 million valuation for a dog genetics company, which is pretty crazy. Wow. Okay. I like that because it also eliminates a lot of the fears that people have about data being available. You know, like if you're doing 23andMe, you're worried about where your data is going, you're worried about, and they're worried about how much information to give you. But if it comes to dogs, we're much more open. That was one of the reasons why we did it is there's limits on genetic information for humans and what type of research you can do with that. But dogs also get glaucoma. And so if you understand that a dog has these genetic markers and it tends towards this health condition, you can sample size hundreds of thousands of dogs, get hundreds of thousands of different genetic markers, and then apply that to human research. Mm. And so we weren't sure what the marketing message was for this company when we were going live. We were like, well, do people want to know if their golden retriever is actually a golden retriever? Like, what do they want to know their, their ancestry piece? And so we were on this like news station and they had this little ticker tracker saying like, would you be interested in getting this product? Yes or no. And you could see it kind of like change as we were like doing the messaging, right? And so we were talking about the ancestry and people were like, yeah, sure, I'll get it. And then we started talking about like the 160 different health conditions that we could help figure out for your dog, whether it's skeletal dysplasia or not. And then it just like bounced up to like 90, 95%. Wow. So that was, that was more exciting than I think some of the other startups or companies I've done that are more bootstrapped. So let me ask you this before you move on from this. I see it sold yeah. everywhere. Um, it's basically anywhere from 100 to $200, depending on which test you get and where you get it. Is there ongoing revenue from this? Or once you buy it, you're, you're done? So I was working with them for the first year to get it launched. And what they did after that is they started looking at, well, how can we use this for getting people set up with health insurance? How can we do this for like other types of health and nutrition needs? But for the most part, most customers, it's one off. And I think that's probably a pretty big opportunity is to look at other parts of like the customer life cycle, which is like, can we help with dog training? Can we help with like connecting them to other types of health and nutrition? Mm -hmm. All right. What was the third one? 
The third one is Support Ninja. So that's a little bit of how we met yeah. is I met Andrew in Bali yep. for the Running Remote Conference. And I ran an outsourcing kind of like international hiring, managing, and training company for companies like Uber, Lyft, uh, Bill, and Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so we had these offices scattered around and, and we met at this conference for essentially companies that are running remote prior to the pandemic. That one grew up pretty fast as well. Not as fast as Embark, but that one did pretty well as well. Can you say what it sold for? So it's currently underneath a private equity company. It sold for around 40 million initially. And then right now it's probably going to be selling in the next couple of years. And it's probably going to be in the uh, mid to upper nine figures, hopefully. Well, are yeah, you at all fingers connected crossed. to them? Yeah, so I stepped down as CEO in June, and right now I'm just sitting on the board, but I am probably their biggest cheerleader mm. on the sidelines as a, as a post a founder. Yeah, it's such a killer idea, too, doing support outsource for companies. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs try it, and it just didn't work for them. And I don't know why. It might have been that they were working, they were looking for other startups like them. As someone who's done interviews with entrepreneurs for years, I would have Tons of people say customer support stinks. It's too painful. And they would say, when you're starting out, you can't do it 24 hours. So I will do it for you. Thing is that when companies are starting out, they can't really afford it. And I know that's one of the issues, right? What else have you seen that didn't work for others in that space? Yeah. So it's interesting that you, you think it's exciting because when we were getting into it, it wasn't exciting. Like this is kind of like the industry where like it wasn't a good industry. Like if you think about call centers in India, and like the different places, it's not an exciting business model for people to get into. And I was talking to another entrepreneur that's well known. He's like, how did you get into this outsourcing space? It's like so exciting. And, and he called it a sexy business idea. And I'm like, man, this is not like, it's not like that. But where I see people fail is that they don't really understand the value proposition for what they're doing. Like, yeah, you can get 24 seven support that's important but that's very niche what you're really doing with having uh, an outsourcing company and why i'm passionate about it and why i think everyone should do it is you used to only be able to hire people that will like lived on your street or lived in your city or, or your block and with the internet and with outsourcing you can hire the best person wherever they might be add a lot more diversity to your company these people are fantastic it's like you're 100xing your your recruiting pool and if you realize that there's that element to it, that there's that the dollar goes a lot farther and can have a, a much bigger impact in some of these different countries, and you can bring in diverse talent. I mean, it's like a no brainer. I guess I was also thinking of it as, as text based. And for some reason, text based support feels more exciting than another call center. But is that what you were doing? Yeah. So we were doing a lot of different stuff. We were doing a lot of um, text support, a lot of asynchronous support. So that's like email. That's crossing over into to chat. We did have some voice support, but it was a lot more than that. We also had like EAs. We had people that were doing different types of marketing jobs, a lot of different job descriptions we were doing internationally, essentially. I can't believe how well this type of business is still doing. So I don't know if you know Jesse Puji. I work with Jesse on, on a few projects. Freaking guy started a growth assistant, just support for people who are in the growth part of businesses. It is taking off like you wouldn't believe. He's showing his numbers constantly on, on Twitter. He's, he's not keeping this private so you can see the growth. But it's essentially like support ninja for this one aspect of a business. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, if you look at Athena, like has a great reputation in the market. It's by the chief operating officer of Task Us, And they focus solely on EAs. And so they're like, Hey, this is like a playbook that you can run, a course that you can take on, on delegating. They're blowing up and they're growing fantastically. Ocean is another one that's, that's great. And so all these ones that are focusing on niches essentially, but how to get the best talent in Colombia or Argentina or the Philippines, they're, they're growing really, really fast. But yeah. So Andrew, I want to bounce it to you really quick. Mixer G's at, you've done t over 2000 episodes. What are you, what are your plans next? How do you see Mixergy growing, evolving, changing, staying the same? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I've used Mixergy as a place for me to learn what I couldn't get 
anywhere else. I'm not sure exactly where my curiosity is right now. And so I'm leaving myself very open to talking to people and seeing if something is exciting enough that I want to spend more time on it. I'll give you an example of how I've used it over the years. I had a software company after this greeting card company that didn't work. And I said, all right, I'm going to talk to software entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs and see what does work. And then I thought it would be another software company, but then it turned out the content was blowing up. And I would interview people who kept saying that they had content businesses that were doing well. And I said, yeah, but it's not going to do that well. And then they ended up just doing incredibly well and having happier lives. So one example of that is Ramit Sethi. Ramit Sethi was a guy who had a blog about personal finance. And I thought, come on, don't you want to become a software entrepreneur? And the more I talked to him, the more I realized he's doing really well thinking about ideas and personal finance, helping people save money, get better jobs. He's super happy. His business kept growing and was profitable consistently. Just a little while ago, he got a show on Netflix. I don't think he needed software, but I had to do a set of interviews about software and have other entrepreneurs redirect me to content to finally appreciate the value of content on Mixergy. After I built Mixergy as a content site, we had courses, membership, advertising. I got overwhelmed. I couldn't keep, it, keep track of it all, even with a team of people. And so I said, how do I organize this? And I did a series of interviews on how do I systemize my company? And I got to ask all the things that I couldn't ask of the book that I remember my entrepreneurship professor at NYU gave us. He gave us the E-Myth Revisited, and it talked about how to systemize a business. But I still had questions like, what happens when you have a creative business? Can you really force people in a creative business that's constantly changing to systemize? How do you do it? And I had to get a lot of feedback from people who are in software, who are in creative, competitive businesses that kept changing. And the answer was some things you can, some things you want to leave up to people to, to be creative about. But when they are creative, have them think about how they came up with what they came up with. So documentation works there. Today, I'm, I'm a little bit more open-minded again and trying to see what comes next. Do you have any contenders? Anything that you think is, might, be, might have a little kernel of something that's exciting? I'll tell you what I'm really, of the, all the things that I've been curious about, one of the things that I've noticed is that these services-based businesses are doing well. I had a few people actually reach out to me, especially after I wrote my book. Here it is. Stop asking questions about how to do interviews. They said, well, can you just produce our interviews for us? And so I started saying yes, and at times just introducing my producer to them. So Greg Eisenberg, who's got a great podcast, one of my favorites, he hired Ari DeSormo, who was our editor, to work with him part-time. And then my first million guys, they hired Ari, and they checked in with me to say, is she really good? I said, she's absolutely phenomenal. And they work with her now full time. But I then took on other people who wanted to have their podcast produced and I started producing podcasts for them. And now I'm kind of interested in how businesses like Video Husky, which are mm. services based businesses that are super systemized, how do they work? How do they deliver? How do they get customers? And so I'm, I'm interested in those kinds of interviewees and I'm learning a lot from them. So can you share a little bit about Video Husky? Like I've seen their website, the outsource video editing, but can you share a little bit about what they are and, and why they're interesting? They're, like you said, outsource video editing because this founder decided that he was doing ad buys and he realized that video ads were doing well, but it was a pain to get video made. It's always been a pain. And yes, you can use automated tools to do it, but they never feel as good as a really well done video. And he liked Design Pickle, which basically said, pay us a monthly fee and we'll create all the images that you need for your ad. And it did really well with ad agencies. And he said, you know what, I'm going to create the Design Pickle of video. And then he went to this one online group called Dynamite Circle. And he said, if I can get, I think, I forget how many customers he said, maybe like 10. If I could get 10 within this limited amount of time, then I'll start this business. At the last minute, he hit his number and he got enough customers that he was able to build this up. And he hired uh, video editors and he started to systemize his business. I forget where, where it is today, but he got to a million relatively easily. How where, did he get to his second million? Do you know? No, you should talk to him about that. I, to me, how he realized that there's some people who are just going to churn, how he even built his software stack to make sure that he was organizing it all well. He signed up for a program with uh, the founder of Design Pickle to teach him how to run this business and also just learn from him. Russ, who created Design Pickle, he is a maniac in some ways. He didn't just show him how to create this, this business. 
He spent a lot of time showing him how to become a better, stronger man, be more ambitious, work harder, exercise more. And I remember Justin telling me, you know what? I'm not that motivated. I don't want to be that. I just want to build a nice, solid business that will let me live a life that I want. And he's doing that. And I think it's like for entrepreneurs, there's there's different levels of what type, what that life looks like for you, right? What does that entrepreneurship life look like? So you were talking about Video Husky. And what I'm seeing is that there's these agencies that are taking one part of what a marketing a department will look like. And they're saying, I'm going to do this part of your department for uh, this flat rate fee. And then you're just building like Legos, essentially a marketing department. So $2,000 for unlimited video editing, $5,000 for podcast. You know what I mean? And then you're yes. building your department that way. Have yeah. you been seeing this? I wonder if that model is going to do well. Or I wonder if there's going to be someone that's going to be the Lego master builder. I don't know. That's actually a good, a good question, right? Like, do you hire Design Pickle and Video Husky and someone who does your text and someone who does this? Or do you hire someone who puts them all together and gets you the best of them? Or do you hire one agency and you say you do it all? I don't know. I, I'm getting the sense that maybe it can all exist together. Maybe there is someone who just manages that stack of all these different outsourcers you have. Like you say, the master builder. It's almost going to be entirely based on the influencer that's backing that product. They're like, oh, I want to do... So like support shepherd because that's what is big on my first million or they're like i really want to use this website designer because that's tied to this influencer i think that might be where it kicks in i definitely think that that's a big entry point hey podcast listeners i made operator equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur-led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to operatorequity.com. I'm really excited about this new project, and I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. I do know of some people that are interested in looking at building these, these influencer marketing, like almost like agencies, like matching businesses to influencers. I'm a little curious to see how that's going to play out. That could be pretty big. I can see each company having their own influencer signed, almost like a, a sports athlete. I also think that more entrepreneurs are going to become micro influencers of their, themselves. They need to do it. I was just at Noah Kagan's house yesterday. And I said, Noah, you used to be public because you had this need for people to like you, to know you, to admire you, to whatever it is. You don't seem to have that anymore. Why are you writing this book? Why are you doing a YouTube channel? Why are you doing a podcast? Especially since Noah is someone who has interests. He likes to go for long bike rides. He likes to disconnect from the world. Why is he putting in all this effort when he doesn't need it emotionally? And he said, you know, every business needs to have somebody who is well-known, who stands out. I've noticed this myself. When you want to buy something, you do look to see who is this guy. I talked to you about that plugin uh, maker from, uh, for AI. I didn't know who the founder was. He signed his thing and he said, thank you for trying out my tool that will let you do AI on every website. And now go install the plugin. And I realized, I don't know you. I'm not going to install a plugin on my computer that gives you access to everything I write when I don't know who you are. I don't trust you. I can go Google you, but I don't see anything when I Google you. I think we're all doing that. We're all Googling the people in our lives. And if, we're, and if they're hoping that LinkedIn is going to be enough, it's not. It's not enough. It needs to be something more significant. I'll even take it a step further. When my kids want to get together with someone, I make it easy for them to get together with them. But I also Google the parents. And if the parents are, someone, are people who are interesting, who I feel like they're safe, who are doing something meaningful in the world, I'm much more likely to say, yes, I see what you're doing. Go ahead. Let's spend time together. I'll spend time with the parents. We're Googling the parents of the kids that our kids want to play with. And LinkedIn is not enough. It's kind of hard to imagine that you need to build your online presence to get access to some things. There's a difference between being a public founder and being a private founder. And it's, there's pros and cons to being both. I mean, being public facing is hard. You know what, though? People do find a thing. Entrepreneurs find a system that works for them. And so Noah's not recording every single week the way that full-time content creators might. I'll give you an example of why it's important and then how people do this. Jess Ma 
is a founder I, I invested in years ago. She created a QuickBooks killer, what was supposed to be a QuickBooks killer. It didn't work out. She ended up creating a bookkeeping service that has all these outsourced bookkeepers who will, who will uh, run your books. And if you're using QuickBooks, she'll do that. You're smiling. You, you recognize her. Yeah, she's, uh, she's blowing up. She's done a lot of really cool stuff. Her latest thing is what she calls Maui. It's a collection of companies that she invests in. Her team reached out to me to say, can you interview Jess? She also did My First Million. She's done a couple. I asked her, I said, Jess, why are you doing this? You, you're busy. You don't have a passion for this anymore. She said, when I'm hiring someone, they're Googling me to see what comes up. She can't do a full-time podcast. So what she does is her team will book her on other podcasts. They booked her on Pep Laya's podcast, My First Million, on my podcast. Maybe they'll do a couple of others. I think she's going to eventually need to find a way to control her own message. At some point, you run out of other podcasts to do that you feel you can trust, and they could manipulate everything. The simplest manipulation is when does it run, right? You do an interview today, and they say, you know what? I know you put in all this time. You interrupted your day. I'm not going to run it for two months because I have a backlog or because I'm flaking out, or I'm not going to run it at all because it doesn't fit in with my style. I think she would be better to find her own way of getting her message out there. Now, for someone like her, Instagram is not enough. She can't post photos of herself flying around on, the, on her plane, right? If someone's going to go work at that company, they don't need to see her on her plane. It doesn't really add much. They want to know, what, what are you about? And so she's going to need to find a way to do yeah. it. For some people, it's writing. For other people, it's podcasting. For some people, it's something else. What I liked about what she said is that she didn't view it as like a venture studio geared towards science. After I sold swag, I had so many people, so many friends, but I cannot believe that sold so quick. I can't believe you. And I'm thinking to myself, how many years did I have hitting my head against the wall and failing? And it's all part of the long cycle. It's never just like a success beginning and end. It's a lifetime sport. That's what entrepreneurship is. Hey, co-founders, welcome to My Second Million with Connor Tompkins, where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies. In this episode, Connor chats with Jeremy Parker, a seasoned entrepreneur with a rich background in launching and selling businesses like Swag.com. So without further ado, Jeremy Parker. Hey everyone, I'm here with Jeremy. He's the founder and he started Swag.com. I know that I was a customer of Swag.com back in the day, but you also started a bunch of other things. So you started out as a award-winning video filmmaker and then you 
moved around quite a bit. You did T's and Tats for two years, Tippet, and then Swag.com. I just want to hear a little bit about how you went from filmmaking to t-shirts, essentially. Great question. So I was a documentary production major in college, and I made a movie mm. with my brother called 1%. It was about the top one wealthiest percent of Americans, and there's a little bit of a twist to it, so I want to ruin it for people who want to see it. But we were at the Vail Film Festival, and I remember I was on the top of the mountain, and half the room were these major celebrities that everyone heard of, and half the room were these struggling artists, and I asked myself a question, two questions really. Number one, did I love what I was doing? And number two, was I that good at it? And both answers were no. It was like the slap in the face. I was 19 years old, I believe, at the time, and I just came up the biggest highs of the world. I'm like, this is like the pinnacle of where I wanted to get to. And I woke up the next morning realizing I need to make a shift in my life, that maybe this is not the right path for me. It was like very weird for my family, like, what are you talking about type of thing. And I went back to college and I finished my Boston University, got my degree, I had one more year to go. And I wanted to start a business. I didn't know what I was good at. I, I knew from filmmaking, I was you know, fairly good at telling stories. And I felt like being a brander or I'll figure out what I was good at. So I started a t-shirt company called Tees and Tats. Now, Tees and Tats was a high-end t-shirt company, 200 to $300 t-shirts. I'm not particularly fashionable. Like I, I don't really love fashion, but I thought it would teach me what I liked about business, what I was good at and what I was bad at. You know, starting a t-shirt company sounds fairly simple, but you have to create a website and branding and design and manufacturing and PR and all these different things. And we ended up launching Tees and Tats, probably the worst time in the market. It was 2007. And your audience could rewind 2007 the recession, especially launching a high-end t-shirt company. So all these stores I was hustling and selling to were all either going under or saying, of course, you're not going to buy or re-up on your order of t-shirts. And it was a very dark place when you're just starting your first business and you felt like you didn't have even a shot because everything was against you. But I came up with this now a little bit gimmicky. And at this point, I was 22 years old, but I tied the price of our shirts to the price of the Dow Jones. So for every 100 points that Dow dropped, they would get a discount on their t-shirt price. It was like a, a market-related pricing model. That was like a, my idea. To try How to did you come up with this? Like that seems, I would never even think about that. Yeah, I, I was just trying to throw everything against the wall, trying to say like, well, no one's buying. Why are they not buying? Because they're scared about affording regular food. How can I get them to feel confident to buy from us that they would get a discount? It's kind of like this progression. And I wrote a letter mm. to Mark Cuban. This is early days. And I was like, I guess a, a burgeoning entrepreneur just trying to get out there. And Mark Cuban had this blog called Blog Maverick. And I wrote to him and I said, this is the story. And he ended up within 10 minutes responding to me and saying, I love the hustle. Do you mind if I write about you in my blog? He wrote about us, got picked up by Ad Age. They wrote about us. And ultimately, I got introduced to this guy, Elliot Pizer. Now, Elliot Pizer is the founder and CEO of a company called MV Sport. They're a large, very large company in the promotional product space. So I got introduced through this industry of promotional products that I never even heard of when I was 23 years old. I had no idea what this was, but I would start going to different trade shows and I would see this industry is massive. It was over a $20 billion industry, but I noticed something at the time. All the buyers were 40 to 50 year olds. And I was by far the youngest person as 23 year old walking up and down these hallways. And I'm like, I guess this is just maybe how it's done. Everything was broken and old and fragmented and presentation decks to close sales and all these different things. And I said to Elliot, do you mind if I start a business under your label? And I pitched him this idea called Vote for Art. And Vote for Art was getting licensed agreements with different college campuses. And we would do a graphic design contest at University of Maryland and the winning design would sell at the bookstore. So we democratized collegiate apparel. I don't know if you remember like Threadlist. It was these design contests back in the day. So yeah. we want to be the design contest for uh, collegiate licensed products. And we launched at, I mean, I don't even know how many schools, but nearly 100 schools at this point, Purdue University, Arizona State. And we, we partnered up with the schools, to, did design contests, sold it at the bookstore. I learned a lot about the industry of promotional products, college apparel. How did you make that pitch to the CEO saying, hey, I want to do a subsidiary underneath your brand. You should trust me. Yeah. So, so after he, he reached out to me for this connection, we became kind of friendly. We would bounce off ideas. I would go to his office legitimately like once a week and we'd have like lunch together and I would be, we'd just talk, we would freestyle different ideas and he liked my creativity. I think he just liked it from the T's and Tats and the mm. market relating pricing model. He was like open to new ideas. He's a very open-minded CEO and we just hit it off. And at some point, the more I kept learning about their business, they had MV Sport, this college thing, they had Weatherproof Garment Company, a really large outerwear company. It's a huge company. And he said to me, if you have any ideas 
that you would want to start under my umbrella, I would be happy to fund it. And for me, it was an amazing learning experience. I learned so much and I was, I guess, they call it entrepreneur starting a business underneath a, a bigger company. So yeah. but it felt like really like I was just keep, you know, progressing and learning and getting better as an entrepreneur. I think a lot of people think they need to start from scratch, right? And there's a lot of other ways you can buy an existing business or even work underneath an existing business. And you probably learn from like their structure. As I learned uh, what to do, what not to do, how to maneuver everything. I mean, college apparel licensing is very complicated. I don't want to go too deep on it, but if you want to do a contest for University of Maryland, you have to go to the licensing department and you have to win them over and make them feel confident, which is not an easy sell when you're saying we're going to reimagine your school logo through graphic design. I mean, that's, that's like a no-no. Like everyone said it's not going to work. And then once you get the licensing department to say, yes, you could do a contest, which is a miracle in and of itself, you then have to sell to the bookstore. And they're not in the same department. They're actually oftentimes working against each other. So everything had to kind of work. And it was this process of getting licensing agreement and then getting the bookstore to buy into it. So it was a lot of learning. And at 24, I mean, I couldn't have asked for, for a better experience. I left that after about three years. I joined my brother who had a company called uh, Tip Media. And we started, it was very crazy. My brother had this amazing insight where basically he realized that, you know, you watch American Idol and all the judges on American Idol are drinking out of a Coke can. And obviously they're not drinking Coke and they're getting product placement. And then he was watching YouTube videos one day and he realized, well, all these YouTube stars were making no money living in their parents' basement, but getting tens of millions of views. Now, everybody thinks of that as everybody makes a lot of money now, who are YouTube stars, right? Instagram exists and everyone does product placement. But I want you to rewind you know, 13, 14 years ago when my brother was doing this. It didn't exist. I mean, I think Twitter at, at this time, if you can put perspective, Pitbull, the rapper, had about 4,000 followers on Twitter at that point. Now he has like 40 million. So things were so, so early. And my brother notices, and it was amazing. And he's like, let me get these big brand names like State Fart, Colgate, Verizon into the YouTube videos. It was like this really key insight. So this is like early influencer marketing, right? It was like the first, it was the first influencer marketing really and getting these, these YouTube stars, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars that they otherwise never would have made. Yeah. And when I joined, it became a conversation, well, why are we just stopping at these YouTube stars? Why don't we buy up the rights to major celebrities and their Twitter and Facebook posts? So we started reaching out to Pitbull and different celebrities and trying to get their rights to their, their social handles. And we started to buy a lot of celebrity rights and owning their rights. And ultimately, that company got bought by a publicly traded company. What was shocking about this is that it was such a short amount of time. Like this was happening in 2011. For that to go from inception to generating revenue to an actual acquisition in that short amount of time is pretty remarkable. Well, actually, the truth is, we for that business, we didn't even have a business that sold anything yet. The, the idea was what got acquired by the public company was our contracts. So our idea oh. was this very high level idea. This was the, the, and I think, I still think it's a good idea and it probably could have done well if we didn't sell it. Our idea was this, what if we had a list of questions of a hundred different questions? What's your favorite toothbrush company? What's your favorite snack food? And then we go to celebrities and we give them this list of questions and they fill out their actual answers, like their genuine, authentic answers. Then we could go to all the brands that they list in that genuine, authentic questionnaire and we could say, hey, Colgate, LeBron James loves you. Just throwing out a name, right? He actually wants to tweet about you guys to his millions of followers on Twitter and Facebook. Let's do a Groupon-like deal where we do a deal where we get where LeBron says to his, LeBron wasn't a partner, but I'm just using his name, for example. LeBron says yeah, to his 30 million followers. So you know. Yeah, just so you know. You pay, you know, you pay $50 and you get $100 worth of credit and then based on the 50 us, the celebrity and the brand all split it. And it came very organic, but this was so early. This was like Groupon was just coming out. There wasn't anyone really connecting sub celebrities to this at this point. And I did that for a few years. Then I had a failure. I started a company called Vouch. It was a social networking app based on what you love to do. And my partner was my brother and Jesse Itzler, who's a you know, very well-known entrepreneur, started yeah. Marquee Jet, private jet companies, Eco Coke in the water. He's one of the owners of Atlanta Hawks. And we started a social networking app, which I think is really an amazing idea still. I just don't think we built the right solution. So Vouch was democratizing Oprah's favorite things for everyone. So when we looked at Facebook and we said, Facebook's this massive platform and everyone's taking a bit and piece of Facebook to build this dedicated experience. Instagram takes the pictures and Twitter takes the status update. We want to own the like button. And we felt like the like button is the most monetizable aspect of Facebook. But if we could build a really amazing platform where it's fun to vouch for your favorite things. People could follow their friends and celebrities and see what they like and get recommendations and be able to purchase within the app. And I think the idea is really good. And we made it cool and it felt different. 
But I think our biggest mistake, in hindsight, you only know this. While you're building it, you don't really realize this. But in hindsight, we built it very similar to Instagram, where it was time-based. So when people joined our platform and they vouched for 100 things that they love, they just vouch for all their stuff. By the second or third week, they don't really have that many things to vouch for left, right? Because they already pushed everything out. There's no reason to re-engage or to continue. Okay, Exactly. It's like a month later, they find another book that they read that they love. So because it was organized with like time-based, people were on on their feeds following people and there wasn't a lot of content coming. Like we could have made a simple change and organized in a different way that I think could have worked. But, you know, you live and you learn. Whenever I look at Vouch and I look at Tip, there's some things that I feel like would work now. If you were to go out and do Tip 2.0 and like the influencer economy, and what I like is that it's organic. You already like these things. You already like these brands. Let's pair them together. That's exactly our idea. It it wasn't about just putting a random brand and trying to find a celebrity who looked good in, in a picture. It was about getting authentic. It was really, the idea was true authenticity. And yeah. I think we were ahead of our time, honestly. I think if we started it now, it could really work. Vouch as well. All right, Jeremy, let's go. We have some yeah. work to do. <laughs> next time, next, maybe next. After spending three years on Vouch and shutting it down, I really wanted my next business to be something where it didn't have to become this global phenomenon for us to make money. Because social networking apps, we had hundreds of thousands of users for Vouch and it didn't take yeah. off. And I just started Swag.com. So it really takes me, it's like life... Like it all worked. And with swag, it was one of these things where I, I had some industry knowledge from my earlier days under MD Sport. And I had this experience over, over eight years after that of building products, not necessarily a successful one, but at least building products and seeing what works and figuring out the right brand. And I figure if I could build the right solution for today's buyer, that 20, when I was 22, it was 40 to 50 year old. The buyer today is a millennial. Well, how do you build them the right solution for today's buyer? So we went all in on building swag.com and we grew you know, over 100%, 300%. I mean, every year it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until 2021, we were doing a little bit north of 30 million uh, a year when we sold in November of 21. And now we're part of Custom Inc. They're a much larger company. They're like the number one cu- company in our industry. They're really focused on more consumer. We were really focused on B2B. And it was like the perfect pairing of optimizing and and using the same backend and infrastructure to really streamline the whole industry. Hey, podcast listeners, we are currently looking for sponsors for this podcast. If you guys are looking to connect with other business owners that are scaling and growing their company, and you guys are interested in a spot on this podcast, uh, we're looking for you. So reach out to cardtopkeys.com or operatorequity.com, and we're glad to help set you guys up with a spot on this podcast. All right, cheers. Back to the pod. This blew my mind because you're selling shirts. There's a lot yeah. of people in that space. Yeah, totally. Um, and there's local players, national players. And for you to beat them out and have, I think it, you said 15,000 companies yep. that you sold to means that you just had to execute that much better than, than everyone else. What was the marketing approach? How did you engage with this many B2B buyers? So early days when we were building the platform, we didn't really know the right solution. Oftentimes yeah. entrepreneurs have some ego involved and they think they know all the answers and I try to remove ego completely from the equation. Like I knew I wanted to go after B2B, but I wanted to be going after companies. I initially thought that the buyer within the company would be the marketing team. That was like my initial insight because marketing teams have you know huge budgets. They're not only buying for their best customers or buying for leads. They could have a team of 10 people, but have million dollar, millions of dollars of marketing spend because it depends on who their customers are. But then yeah. when I was starting to talk to all these marketing managers and I would find them on LinkedIn, and I discovered that everyone's going after the marketing team. How am I going to differentiate myself, right? There's, there's literally 23,000 promo distributors who are selling swag. How can I, with nothing, with no platform at this point, with a coming soon landing page, how can I differentiate myself? And what I noticed talking to them is that really the office manager should be the one I should go after. No one oh, was going after the office okay. manager. And yeah. what I realized is office managers might not be buying as much swag as the marketing teams, but... If every single label inside the t-shirt said powered by swag.com or swag.com, our tagline at the time was we made this, that would be like doing the marketing for ourselves. Like the office manager buys for the marketing team and for the sales team and for this office and that office. These divisions will now learn about this and ultimately say, well, my company already uses them. The quality is great. Why don't I use them as well? So it was kind of like our Trojan horse into the company to expand. And we went all in on this office manager persona and it allowed us to really scale fairly quickly. Other people start copying this eventually, but it, it allowed us really to be super differentiated early on. So were you guys doing cold walk-ins to offices? Oh, totally. Just be like, hey, like, I know you're working the front desk. Look at this shirt. It's incredibly soft. 
oh, even more than that, <laughs> even more than, I mean, we, we were in the WeWork Times Square, me and my co-founder, Josh, would every day, literally every day, and I'm not the most outgoing person naturally, but I would have to like knock on doors and put myself out there and who does swag and have conversations. When you're there, they can't really say no. It's harder for them to say no. They, they'll rather give you 10 minutes. And for me, it wasn't about selling. It was more about just learning why they wouldn't, mm. why are they wanting to buy from us and why are they not wanting to buy from us? So we did that a lot. I went to uh, Facebook was one of our earliest customers. I had a connection or somebody connected us. I forgot how it was, but we got into the Facebook office and we didn't really know anyone in the office, but in New York City, they had this amazing office. It was an empty room. We just literally put our stuff out there like we were traveling salesmen and people would walk by the room and ultimately somebody would come in and say, oh, you guys sell swag. And they probably assumed we were allowed to be there, but we weren't. You just hijacked a, cof- a conference room? Yeah, just walked in and we set <laughs> something up and they bought, you know, I think it was like $3,000 worth of t-shirts. That was our first order for Facebook. And for me, I didn't care about making a profit. I think I probably even lost a little bit of money. Maybe we made like 1% margin. It was about mm. getting the logo in the beginning. Like for me, I, w- I thought of myself as a logo hunter. For the first couple of months, I wanted when people go to my website to say, yeah. oh, they work with Facebook and we work and this company and that company, because then it gives confidence to everyone else. It didn't matter about making money early on. It was about learning the right product to build and also getting those early logos. So I want to highlight the the cold walk-in thing because yeah. only a handful of people I know have done this. And that's like working your way from the front desk to the back and just doing door to door, taking a picture of a directory being like, oh, I want this logo and this logo. Here's the approach. Like it takes some stones to do that. But then also the feedback loop to your point is incredibly tight. I think more people should do that. They're people, they're used to door to door sales people for like pots and pans, but they're not used to it for B2B. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, especially if you're younger, they're willing to give you a shot. Totally, totally. I always say to my team, you know, do the unscalable things in the early days. There's mm-hmm. so many things that we just don't do because it's like, oh, we can't scale. Well, we don't need to scale now. We need to figure out, do we even have a product <laughs> here to scale? So, yeah, yeah, and I'll 100%. talk about Swag Space in a bit, but I'm, I, I get my mindset back into the startup phase. And I, you know, last eight years, I've been more of a CEO and it's a different mindset. I got to like change my mindset to get back into what I was early on, being so aggressive in many ways, but also adaptable and figuring out and doing things that are just so not scalable, but that get you to like build the right solution. Whenever I look at your profile, the coverage that you get in the press and then the brands that you're able to get, I think it highlights some of what you're talking about. Even in your T's and tats, you're reaching out to Mark Cuban, you have these articles and Thrillist and LA Splash mm-hmm. and, and Tipped, it was the same. And then And Vouch, you also had a lot of coverage. So is that a big part of your approach is you're not just collecting names, but you're also trying to get out in front of PR agencies or the right journalists or the right publication? I think to some degree, I think with Vouch, a lot of the press was probably more ego on my side, if I'm being truly honest. Like it it made you feel like something was happening. A lot of people, and I think a lot of young entrepreneurs, they get into press and they feel like they did something. And I think I probably fell into that same bucket when I was younger also, like wanting to make myself feel better. So getting this press, getting a story out there, you know, maybe it got some users so you could say, oh, this is good for users, but it probably is an ego thing, if I'm being truly honest. With swag, it's different because for swag, it it became important to get some press about swag because people Google, you know, as you said, we're dealing, we're competing against 23,000 other companies who sell promotional products. How could we differentiate ourselves? If people go to swag.com, Obviously, the brand has to look strong and the website and everything has to be really good, but they might say, who else uses them? And if they see some articles of, oh, these 100 brands use them, 1,000 brands, it gives people confidence. And it's like this self-fulfilling thing where the more people that use you, the more people feel safe using you and they start using you as well. So it's like this perfect cycle. It's hard to build trust. I mean, everyone can build a amazing looking website right now and can generate content so quickly. And so how do you generate trust if everyone has a website, everyone has a blog? It's the brands and the PR or the community that you build around it or your personal voice. Like it's now expected for the CEO to go out and do podcasts or Mm -hmm. to share the story directly. How did your job change from when you were going to door to door and doing the cold walk-ins to being a CEO of a company generating $30 million in revenue? Yeah, that's a, that's the main thing. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, um, you're, you're everything, right? You're the, you're the founder, Mm -hmm. you're the entrepreneur, you're the CEO, you're head of marketing, head of sales, head intern. I remember early days, I would make <laughs> delivery drives. I would drive with my co-founder, Josh, four hours when we were making our early deliveries to WeWork summer camp. You know, WeWork has yeah. this big summer camp every year. We won the bid. We made like no margin, but it was okay because as I said before, every t-shirt had swag.com in, in their label. And we could just imagine them giving out 5,000 WeWork t-shirts that are awesome printed with our logo. 
it will get us customers. And it did. It got us a lot of customers who felt it and said, like, well, we are uses us. We should use us. But we didn't have any money. So we rented a U-Haul. We drove four hours. We had my whole family. I have a picture here, like rolling t-shirts for days. We had to roll 4,000 t-shirts. So I had my grandma. I kept oh doing everything. Gosh. You're so hands-on in the early days. And then, and then CEO becomes a totally different thing. People management and mm. there's different layers in between and there's different types of problems and you're working on optimizing this and that. It like becomes more of an optimization and improving and cost efficiencies. And, and for me, it's not truly what I love to do. I love being a founder. I like creating something out of nothing. And I knew that. Often founders put themselves or they get put in the CEO role and it's hard to break out of that. Like it's very rare. I don't know that many founders who are CEOs who then willingly step away from that CEO role pre-exit or pre like being forced out. It seems like a, it's not a very common thing. And I think founders and entrepreneurs just get put in that position and then their role has to change. But it is a completely different job. It's, it's 100% a different job. You're there by the merit of being early. Yep. Right. And what got you there won't get you to the next stage or the next early. level. Um, one of my advisors in college, his name was Bob Metcalf, and he created the Ethernet cable for like 3Com. And that was one of the stories that stuck with me is he was like, I invented this technology. I was an entrepreneur. The company was growing really fast. But then I had to find another CEO that had done that stage of the journey. Mm hmm and could do that CEO job. And I, he was like, I was the entrepreneur, but you could tell that, I mean, he's, this is 30, 40 years ago for him. And yet he, you could still see that there's like a little hint of like, even though there's like wisdom there, that there's a little bit of hurt. It's hard to say that something isn't for you or that you're not the right person to take it to that next stage. Mm -hmm. And I think there's attachment to that CEO title for founders mm -hmm. where you're like, chief executive officer, I built this team, I built these leaders up and I'm attached to all these different employees and you see your fingerprint on like a bunch of different stuff. But for you to move on from having your identity wrapped up in the company to being something different, you have to let it go and you have to delegate. It's almost like the final seat you have to delegate. And I think there's a difference in mindset between a manager and an executive and the executive and the CEO and a CEO and an investor or a serial entrepreneur. Would you change that? Like for the next company that you do, how would you do it differently. Yeah, it's challenging. So for me, and I, I mentioned this earlier, even before the podcast, but my new role is I founded this new company called Swag Space underneath the parent company, Custom Inc. So we got bought by Custom Inc. in 2021, end of 2021. I was the CEO of Swag.com up until about a month and a half ago. And I had these internal questions and I love being an entrepreneur. I love creating something and nothing. My identity was very much tied to being the CEO of swag.com. But in every conversation, people come up to me like, oh, this is the CEO of swag.com. This is the swag guy. It's everything. It's like all encompassing. And you have to really look, I had to look myself in the mirror and say, number one, am I even the right person to be the CEO of this company? Is there somebody, even in my company or outside my company, who could do what I'm doing way better? And I believe there was. I don't know if I'm the number one ultimate best CEO. That's not my skill set. It's not what I truly love to do. We have this woman on my team, Gita. I found her on LinkedIn. I hired her two years ago. She's unbelievable. And I talked to her and I said, I think you could probably do a better job than me as being the CEO. I think you could take the business from what we're doing now and double it and triple it. Way more efficient. And I think you would actually enjoy that over me. I think it just makes more sense. And for me, I know that I want to start something new. So I told my boss, Mark, CEO of Custom Inc. And I said, I think you're getting a lot more value out of me being a part of this company if I could just start something new. So... I came up with this new idea called Swag Space. I'll briefly give you the run I, the idea, and I think it, it could be amazing for your audience, everybody, really. The, this I'm is on, high level. Let's idea. do it. So there's 22,000, 23,000 promo distributors in our industry. 90% of them are mom and pops. They do between 500,000 and a million dollars a year in sales, right? We do a lot more. There's companies that even do way more than us, but they, the average is about a million dollars, 500,000 to a million dollars a year. They have no technology whatsoever. They have no resources. They're doing all of their sales very fragmented and broken. The old, I call it the old school way, but it's really the current way that they do it. They do presentation decks, back and forth emails, you know, contacting different suppliers, waiting on hold to see inventory counts, creating invoices, collecting sales tax. Every single thing is like an, an annoying process. And when you really think about how much time they focus on selling versus the time they focus on the bullshit, frankly, of getting the orders fulfilled, it's about 20% of their times on selling and 80% of their times on everything else. Getting the orders through the funnel and then fulfilling the orders and all this type of stuff. Swag.com, we spent eight years and tens of millions of dollars through profits reinvested back into the technology. We've made it really easy for companies to buy swag. That's what we're really good at. It takes like 
less than a minute. Honestly, you can find what you're looking for, design it, buy it, build boxes, buy it in bulk or hold an inventory for individual distributions. What if we could white label all of our technology and give it for free to the whole promotional product distributor network to allow them to have the best technology in the industry to start selling swag to their audience? And then we take it a step further. Once their customers actually check out through the site, it hits our back end and we become the de facto supplier. So that 80% of wasted time can now be 100% focused on the selling and we handle all the processes. So that was like the initial idea. And then we kept thinking, well, who else does this work for? There's 22,000 screen printers. They would love to sell swag. They can't. Now they can. Event planners, party planners, graphic designers. Imagine a designer creates a logo for somebody. And now that person who just has a logo goes to a different website to buy swag. Why, don't, why doesn't the designer handle the swag and make heavy commission on it? So we just try to make it really, really easy for anyone who wants to sell swag, whether it's their core business, like distributors, promo distributors, or promotional product adjacent, as we think of it, who could sell swag and add another 30,000 revenue stream. I mean, it could be a local mom who has a charity in her network and wants to sell her charity $10,000 worth of stuff and allow her to make 3,000. We give 30% commission on the top line. So it's a very heavy commission structure. We handle all this collecting the sales taxes. We handle everything. We handle the entire process. And we make it really, really easy. So just launched this about 20 days ago. We have you know, about 100 users signed up and people are making a lot of sales through the platform already. We're really starting to build this up. But if you think about the numbers, if you get a thousand of these guys and there's literally hundreds of thousands of opportunity people who could use this, the average is doing 500,000 to a million. You know, this is a, a billion dollar a year business you could get with getting very few promo distributors on board. I'm looking at this. You guys have pretty good traffic to the website. You guys have a few thousand people. How are they hearing about this? Is this just from swag? I guess maybe some swag or from me being ran up in different things. We haven't really done, really done marketing for swag space at all. We just, we were very beta. Everyone has to apply for membership. We're not accepting okay. everybody. Our idea is really not to have more than 150 this year. Because if we get 150 and they actively use our site, that could be 50 to $100 million in our first year of business. So we don't need to have that many people for this to work. We just really want to make sure we have the right product that we're working. I like that you're democratizing it. I like that. You're also doing fully custom boxes. So does that mean that people can essentially make their own subscription box for folks? Yeah. So let's say let's say you're Jenny Promo. You have a promo distributor. Your client's Facebook. Facebook today would want to buy, let's say, custom boxes to onboard their new hires or to send to their best customers. Jenny Promo today can't really do that because Jenny Promo would need to have a 3PL warehouse to consolidate things, to box things. And most of these Kidding, yeah. top shops don't have that. Now they can. Now with our site, Facebook could go on to Jenny Promo's white-labeled version, could find the products, upload it to cart, build boxes effortlessly, all automated, and then check out. And by the way, if Facebook didn't want to do it themselves, because maybe Facebook doesn't want to do it, Jenny Promo could build the carts for Facebook, do all the work for Facebook, and create a link and just share the link with Facebook. So all Facebook has to do is put their credit card in and check out. So we make it really simple for both the customer to do it and also the promo distributor to do it for their customer. But really, the whole system is set up and streamlined. This is fantastic. I signed up, so hopefully I get into the beta for, awesome. yeah, for Swag Space. Hey, podcast listeners. Eight years ago, I started a company called Support Ninja. It's an international hiring, training, managing, outsourcing company to help you find the best talent anywhere. If you guys are interested in hiring international talent, check out supportninja.com. Cheers. This is exciting. All right, so you're a post-exit founder. You yeah. sold a company. You're relaunching inside a new company. Yeah. Is there anything else that you're excited about potentially launching in the next three to five years? Yes, I have a I have about ten and a half months until you know my next thing because I'm incubating right. this idea and I'm trying to get product market fit and build the team and, and hire my replacement technically so I can then move on to the next thing after this. And I have so many different ideas. Like I just write down so many ideas, but it's hard to come up with an idea of an industry that you're not in. Like you don't really know the pain points unless you're really in the industry. I saw the pain points and why I built swag.com because of my time at MV Sport 10 years ago when I saw that the buyer changed. So there's like this key insight that was a little bit different. But to just be like walking on the beach, I live in Miami and think about a whole different idea. I don't know what's good and not good. And then I kept thinking, well, maybe I just stay in the promotional product space because I have connections here and I have a reputation here and I, and I know this industry inside and out. And there's definitely opportunity that still could be done here. But there's things like non-competes and this and that. So it's like, Where'd you even begin? And for you, I mean, like after you had your exit, like how did you think of what you did like afterwards? Like how do you even know what to do? What's the right thing? What you want to focus your time on? 
Okay. So at first I called myself retired for about like a week or two. And that was definitely a lie. And then I have similar to you, I have a list called um, startup ideas. And so these are all the things that I've been sitting on while I was CEO of this company and, and running it day to day. And I just went through that list and I started highlighting the things that I was motivated and excited about. And then also, as soon as I exited, other people would reach out to me and say, Hey, I have this idea that I'm excited about. And you would talk to them about it. And some uh, people approached me about buying their business. And so I started a mini, essentially a venture studio for those who don't know, it's essentially just an incubator where you can either launch your own ideas or buy other companies. And so I started doing multiple things all at once and not necessarily picking one thing. Whenever I got excited, I just moved. So that being said, Jeremy, I might not be the right person to answer this question because I went from having 14, 18 meetings a day to having no meetings and then all of a sudden having 14, 18 meetings again and then trying to make sure that everything is organized and structured. So I am involved in this music lessons business. I'm building it as like a alternative to private equity company that I'm really excited about, a low latency audio product that I think could be fun. I just bought a marketing company last week that I'm really excited about. I'm launching a community for entrepreneurs. So I'm just running around and, and doing what I find is interesting. That's cool. So I think for me, I know I have a finite time where I need to make a decision. And what I'm realizing is my whole life since 22, I've been an entrepreneur and I've had some success and some failures and some success again. And I never gave myself a break to stop. And even after yeah. Valve failed and we, we shut it down, yeah. I never had like that time to kind of like, I just jumped into the next thing because it was, it, I was 30 years old and I was single and I had no money at that point and burned through it. Like I, I, it was necessity to actually build a new startup and build something. And now I don't right. really have the same stresses that I had before swag, if that makes sense. So now I'm like, maybe I should take six months off and just talk to people and have conversations and, and listen, maybe there's opportunities that will come to me that if I just jumped into the next thing too soon, I might regret it. I might like hit that first roadblock and realize, I don't even love what I'm doing. Why did I do this? So I'm try I'm planning on taking a good six months off next year, but I do have some ideas. And if they're still there after the six months, then I think they're <laughs> worth it to continue. That's true. Sit on it. See if you're still excited about it. Yeah. I did not give myself that space and I kind of wish I did. And whenever you talk to other post-exit founders, they always talk about taking that six months to a couple of years off and how they're grateful that they did. But on the other hand, I've been talking to more entrepreneurs now than I ever have in the past. So like on any given week, I'm talking to three to seven different entrepreneurs, hearing about what they're excited about. It gets me excited about my ideas. Sometimes bouncing things off each other helps, but I'm really big on this idea that entrepreneurship is a cycle and it's really a career and it's not a linear thing. You don't sell your business and you're done. It's exactly true. And it's funny. It's like after, after I sold swag, I had so many people, so many friends, but like, I cannot believe that sold so quick. I can't believe you. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, how many years did I have hitting my head against the wall and failing? And it's all part of the long cycle. It's never just like a success, like beginning and end. When I sold my previous company in seven months with contracts, and then I had four years of losing all my money while I burned through it, while I built another company that doesn't work. And then this company doing six years and selling, it's a lifetime sport. That's what entrepreneurship is. And I want to get into the habit of thinking that way. So even if you have successes, that doesn't mean the next company is going to succeed either. I'm just trying to learn and get better every single day and just try to make the right decisions and try to avoid decisions and things I've done in the past that, that haven't been the right thing. As being a successful entrepreneur, I think you naturally get better at it because if you're successful, you see a lot of what goes into building a startup. But I think also failure teaches you also a lot of things as well. So I think it's actually important to have both you know, sides of it. I had a company that failed called uh, Delegated that we sold for parts and it didn't work out. But there's a direct line from Delegated and everything else that I did. I can't imagine without it. And so if you're going into an endeavor or a startup and you feel like you're learning as you go through the process and you're stretching yourself and you're developing, whether that company works or not, you always have that experience. If you were to pull yourself out of that company, there's only a handful of people that can recreate that company and a fraction of the time using all the stuff that you have built and learned. And so I think that's something special because there's no shortage of ideas. There's no shortage of capital that can go into those ideas, but there's a shortage of operators that are willing to execute and try, even if it might result in failure. So I think there's, we still have that with us, right? It doesn't go away. Totally. Jeremy, there is one thing I wanted to ask you. And so Y Combinator came out with this thing called Request for Startups, and it has a bunch of different stuff that they're interested in either investing or inviting some people to join their incubator. 
in different spaces. So just reading off this list, you're talking about machine learning and robotics, defense technology, which might make sense considering the global climate, climate tech, spatial computing. A lot of it's pretty hardcore science. One of them is even a way to end cancer, which is <laughs> like a pretty big broad shot. Is there any of these that kind of stand out to you or anything that you think might be exciting for those next two or three years of, of development? My background is so much into B2B and focused yeah. on that. And all these are very much huge moonshot type of ideas. Yeah, I'm just looking at like machine learning to stimulate the physical world. And a part of me is like, what does that even mean? I think the people who know what this stuff means are the guys that actually solve it. <laughs> They're like, okay, that makes sense to me. I'm looking at this up. I don't think, I don't think Y Combinator wants me in their program. So we need to find like the super smart person that understands what machine learning to simulate the physical world means. And then they need to work with us because then we need to work with a B2B provider. That's, that's a business right there. <laughs> matching up, matching different types of brains. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can be like, yeah, I sold them t-shirts once and I can be like, yeah, they outsourced with us and this, exactly. it worked out great. <laughs> and they should use a solution. We're both in the B2B space. And in some ways I find it easier to start a business, sometimes B2B. I'm a little bit more comfortable with that. I'm a little less comfortable with some of this hard science and how to take it to market. It just seems so variable that you're not just betting on whether you can run and execute a business well, but whether the science will pan out and whether the unit economics will pan out. And I can't even imagine B2C. So uh, I B2C, I've spent a lot of time in B2C. It's much harder, honestly, than B2B. It's just so fickle. There's no way to know like, what's going to take off or what. It feels like way more of a crapshoot. But at the same time, what's kind of like the, the crazy thing with it is that Everyone has B2C ideas. Like B2C ideas, you could come up with any time because you're just like, yeah. you're living in the life and it's, it comes up like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you had this or that? Like in my apartment building in Miami, we had to uh, pay people tips for Christmas. and But they gave us a list, a sheet of all the people's faces. No one's faces, just their names. And I, I don't know half these people. And I'm giving tips based on, they don't even know who they are. It'd be great to have an app where you could tip it and you could see their face. And there's just obvious things that should be there. Right? It's much easier, but actually executing it and getting it out there and making it worthwhile and making it work is so much harder. Like B2B, it's a lot easier. You can really just narrow it down on exactly the customer, the type of customer, and just learn as much as you can about that and try to build them a solution that works for them and most likely will work for other people like them. And then just keep iterating and it keeps you super focused. I think B2B keeps you a lot more focused. One thing I didn't like about starting out as an entrepreneur is I spent so much time pitching and doing some of the stuff like reaching out to PR outlets and trying to do some of the things that I thought looked right because it's the lag indicator mm -hmm. or something that is more of an effect of other successful companies. So I was trying to almost reverse engineer it. And I spent so much time pitching on the companies that were not successful compared to the ones that were where my head was down and I was actually working. I think it's a little bit of a trap. And I think I can see that a little bit in my background whenever I look at some of the companies that I did. I was wondering if you have any traps that you saw that might be helpful to younger founders or people that are just starting out? Yeah, I think a big trap that I found myself early on and, and I even found it myself and with swag um, is even a couple of traps. Raising money. People always think raising money means that you made it in some ways. It's like this weird thing because like you read tech, tech crunch and everything is about the raise, not about like the success or they don't really highlight bootstrap companies at all. It's all about somebody raised 5 million to 7 million and they put this beautiful picture of the founders on it and it makes you feel like yeah. they're celebrities. And I just think that's a big trap. I think honestly, it's a big trap. Most companies that get VC funding fail. And the VCs, I don't think they necessarily care about every company. They want the best company to work and then they really get paid back with one company has this ridiculous, amazing exit and it pays for everybody else. That's just my experience. So like with Swag, we initially thought of ourselves as like a VC backable company and we pitched to a lot of VCs. And after time, we're like, well, we're profitable. Why don't we just reinvest the profit and grow it how we want to grow it and control it and not dilute ourselves? And that was a, a big, I wish I had that knowledge earlier on in my career because I think I wasted a lot of time trying to, I don't know, make it, people feel like, I don't know, make myself feel better by getting somebody else to buy in and give their money. I don't think you necessarily need that for most startups. If you guys are, are listening to this, profit is the key word there. Being able to build a, a profitable business that where you can reinvest the profits and the unit economics work, and you're challenging yourself because you're not doing things that are burning through cash, your customer acquisition cost isn't ridiculous. There's something there. And with Support Ninja, I wanted to be in a place where I didn't have to accept outside funding for any part of the journey. But whenever I did want to go raise funding, 
there would be a line because people saw how profitable the business was and they knew that you know, economics made sense and they knew that this was going places. I wanted to be in the situation where they were coming to me and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can be in that circumstance, it might sound idealistic, but you can buy profitable businesses. You can focus more on uh, bootstrap methodologies rather than pitching your heart out mm -hmm. several times a week. I think there's a, there's a trap in general for entrepreneurs because it is a lonely game. Even if you have a founder or co-founder, it's lonely. It, there's not many people understand it. And usually people in, in your regular life probably think of you as like somewhat of a failure until you're a success. It's like, oh, they're just doing a project. That's not a real job until there's success. So there's this lonely place to be in that oftentimes, at least I can speak for myself, I try to overcompensate with trying to boost up my ego in some ways to make myself feel like I wasn't necessarily that, that failure or I was making things happen. I think it's just a natural tendency as an entrepreneur to want to get validation, whether that's validation from like PR and getting written up in press or validation from a VC, big VC who bought into it. It makes you feel somewhat special, like you're actually not wasting your time. And I think if you can remove the ego from the equation in general as an entrepreneur, you're going to do things, not, so not only just a healthier way to live, you're going to actually be focused on the business without focusing on outside opinions or thoughts or how other people perceive you. You're going to really just think about can I make this business successful? And and I think with swag, I didn't care what anyone thought. I was just so much about heads down and growing it. That was really all I cared about is growing it and growing it profitably and making it work and building the right solution and talking to thousands of customers and doing everything I needed to do, whether it was driving cars or rolling the t-shirts or knocking on doors to make this business successful. It didn't matter. Nothing else mattered. And the next thing you do is going to be so much easier for all the hand-rolled t-shirts that you have done. Thanks. Jeremy, where should people go to find you and see what you're up to? Is Do you have a handle that you prefer? Uh, yeah, I'm not really super active on Twitter, but feel free to reach out to me. Email jeremy at swag.com. Even though I'm no longer CEO, I still have that email. Or check us out at swag.space. I would love to help you out if you think it could be useful, think it could be a cool side hustle. If you have a designer in your network or an event planner or a promo distributor, screen printer, we know we'd love to help them and show them how easy it is to make sales. And we just feel like this is going to be a really game changer for a lot of people. That's awesome. I'm launching this thing called Founder Work for entrepreneurs. And it would be nice if I could send them a box just saying, hey, welcome to this community. Mm -hmm. You're loved. <laughs> Here's a book that you recommend that we recommend. Here's some swag. I just think it helps set the tone. So this is awesome. I want to go check this out. Jeremy, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. That wraps up today's episode with Jeremy Parker. For more inspiring stories and valuable lessons from successful entrepreneurs, be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more episodes on navigating the thrilling path of entrepreneurship. Until next time, keep pushing boundaries and chasing your next million. The market did not want what we were selling. Did the bigger players push back pretty hard? Oh. or? The bigger players sued us. That was a fun Series A announcement. <laughs> hey, world, we've yeah. got a lot of money to build with, and also we're under uh, we're under attack. Hey, co-founders, welcome to My Second Million with Connor Tomkies, where we meet with badass entrepreneurs who've successfully exited their companies. Today's guest, Aaron White, a successful entrepreneur who recently sold two companies, profit well and blissfully, and is now navigating life as a post-exit founder. Oh, hey everyone, I'm here with Aaron White. He recently uh, sold two companies. So one to Paddle and the other one, Blissfully, roughly at the same time. And right now he's figuring out what life is as a post-exit founder, and I'm here to explore that with him. So how's it going, Aaron? Great, thanks for having me, Connor. Really appreciate the uh, chance to be here today. It's good to have you. I really wanna jump into your, your background really quick. Your LinkedIn is a good read. Like, I feel like I could probably start from the bottom and work my way up. And there's a lot of interesting tidbits throughout the way. Would you care sharing a little bit about your your background and, and how you got to the point where you were selling two companies simultaneously and going through that process? Yeah. Yeah. I would be happy to share all that. And, you know, if I could turn LinkedIn to the, the ultimate adventure story, uh, that would be fantastic. A little more ups and downs are in between those events that I think it indicates. My parents had their own business. So when I was young, the dinner table was a conversation between them about what was going on at work. They were doing interior design space planning. So I was living in that, you know, you run a business, that's just what you do mindset from a young age. 
That said, I got really distracted by computers. They brought a PC home one day, and that was the end of me. I just lived in my bedroom playing PC games, dorking around in MS-DOS, things like that. And that continued for a long, long while. So high school, college just got deeper and deeper into tech. And my first job out of school, even in school, was at startups. So I've I've only really ever been in startups. And I think the the largest company I've ever worked at at this point was one of the companies that I was CTO at. So that would be Fender. Prior to that, it was maybe a venture capital firm of 50 people was the largest organization I had been a part of. So I've lived in this very tight bubble of building things and helping others who build things. And the path to kind of a spectacular 2022 for me was long because both of those businesses got started years prior. We started ProfitWell originally as Price Intelligently back in the 2010 timeframe. And you know that's a... a 12-year overnight success story and blissfully was started in 2016. So you've got another you know, eight years, six, eight years before that kind of hit. You were talking about how it was a little bit of like a lifestyle shift. It was a massive shift. You were going from living with family members and then overnight you have these two exits and your circumstances pretty drastically changed. And so how has that transition been over the past couple of years? There's survivorship bias. You know, it's not lost to me that we're having this conversation because things went well, but there's another universe where I'm the same 42-year-old man, but dead broke and really beating myself up. When Blissfully was at uh, a very kind of critical juncture, my wife got very sick, COVID happened, and I just ended up trying to maintain the lifestyle and burnt my finances to the ground to keep the business alive and keep my, my wife as healthy as possible. And that resulted in me living under a conference room uh, table on a mattress, mice jumping off me and, you know, showering where I could get it, et cetera, uh, eating a calzone every night to, you know, soothe my soul, moving in with her family for about a year. And then these two exits happened. So it could have gone another way entirely. But what I know is that I always gave it my all and really went all in on everything I was doing. And so that's, equal parts amazing and enabled some of these outcomes and also can go really hard the other way. But when the two sales came together, things changed pretty fast going from a, a, a house that was letting the cold, the New England cold in in the winter and working out of a basement on a couch to moving down to Florida, buying my first home. That's been great. It's, it's hard not to be thankful that so much weight has been lifted off my shoulders. But in the end, I just kept running a tech startup and building team and building product. And that's outside of family stuff. That's the most engaging thing I could possibly be doing. So that has not changed. But a lot of anxiety is washed away. And that's awesome. Yeah, no kidding. It's going from being responsible probably for two companies and a lot of employees to probably a completely different like day to day. Oh, yeah. Lifestyle. I, have cat. I have to make sure the cat <laughs> is fed. And I'm not even good at that. Hey, podcast listeners, we are currently looking for sponsors for this podcast. If you guys are looking to connect with other business owners that are scaling and growing their company, and you guys are interested in a spot on this podcast, uh, we're looking for you. So reach out to connertompkeys.com or operatorequity.com, and we're glad to help set you guys up with a spot on this podcast. All right. Cheers. Back to the pod. I want to follow your career a little bit because you've worked in a lot of different places and you said that you were interested in computers at an early age. So if you were to pull some snippets as to how you got to where you are now, um, would you mind taking us on that path really quick for those that don't know you? In high school, taught myself how to program and you know found a programming class and I built them an entire business uh, operating system application. You know, You could record your clients, record your invoices, all these things. Maybe you'd call that an ERP. I tried desperately to get them to use this thing and they never would. So kind of set that aside. I ended up studying physics in college out of deep interest in how the universe works. But I found that all of all the roads that that took me were so much less interesting than making things. Making something, showing to someone, getting a chance to wow them just is such a gratifying feedback loop. Uh, and even showing something to someone that they hate it is also a pretty potent and addictive feedback loop. You know, just to jump ahead here a little bit, like if you've got a customer that hates you, that's wonderful or a prospect because hate is an emotion that says, I get what this could be and you're failing to deliver it. And that means you can close that gap. So 
showing people things and getting strong reactions is just really addictive. And so with, you know, with college, I switched from physics into computer science. I was at Carnegie Mellon. It wasn't an easy thing to do because my grades were terrible. Transferred in and that was just the, the, the true beginning of my career as a technologist because I got deep into the theory and married it with my love of building things. And from there, it's been startups and side projects ever since. The real transition from building products and tech into building businesses actually happened at the first startup I worked at post-college. We were making web services debugging software. So, you know, ancient internet protocols called SOAP and WSDL that I'm glad are dead because they were terrible. Our first customer happened to later go on to be the CTO of Amazon, uh, Werner Wogels. So that was pretty awesome. But he was one of the very few customers we had. And I remember going to the sales side of our office. It's like a team of 20 people. And somehow engineering was in this barn and sales was in this barn in the woods of Hollis, New Hampshire. I went over there and I sat down with the sales guy and I said, are we selling anything? And he said, no. And that was, that was a huge punch in the face and a wake-up call for me. And that was the first time I vowed never to only focus on the tech part of product ever again, because it's clearly not enough. The market didn't value what we were doing, or we weren't getting the message out, or we weren't navigating the sales process correctly. Something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I'm a bit of a control freak. And so that was the, you need to be involved in that stuff, Aaron, or you're going to be spinning your wheels, doing things that aren't working that you just can't see. And, and so the next, you know, everything after that, I was co-founder uh, status from, you know, day one, because I just needed that control and that visibility. Otherwise, who the hell knows? And I don't want to leave things up to fate. I like doing and I want to succeed. There's a couple of traps that I think companies fall into. And one is writing thousands of lines of code, even if it's the most beautiful code in the world and it not having a market or not having a customer to, to sell into. And I think I, I fell into that one for sure. The other is to be pitching like nonstop. And the idea that success is, is raising money and, and going down that route and getting mentions in PR articles and that wasn't quite it for us either. And so probably now your approach is very different from back then as far as if you launch anything, it probably already has a market and you probably already have some customers in mind. I f for sure. I, there's definitely a middle ground there. I, I think as a builder, it's easier for me to err on the side of making things than it is to promote what I'm doing. So I I constantly have to pull myself into promotional mode. That said, what I was experimenting with new startup ideas, we would always just create the landing page first, that whole strategy. Just see if there's any latent interest out there in what you're doing. Why not? It's so cheap, but you have to get out of your own way because the moment you lock onto an idea and you say, this thing is is correct because it, it tickles my mind, you've fallen into a trap. You might be N of one. You have no idea or the dynamics might be wrong, et cetera. So trying to get interest and some notion of how distribution is going to work up front is validating probably one of the bigger traps for first-time entrepreneurs, which is making something glorious under the hood that to your point, no one in the world cares about. And then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done. You can make a crystal castle in the sky. And if no one can get there or cares about it, you've wasted time, effort, and a lot of smart people's talents. And that's unfortunate. What were some of the ones that you, you built after this and, and what were the results? After my experience of finding out we weren't selling anything, I over pivoted. I went to consumer and we tried to make a site where kids can make drawings and animations online. It was called do Inc. Uh, pronounced by many people, unfortunately as doink, not a great name. And <laughs> that was really, that was still closer to the same problem. We got half a million kids using it, but where we failed was we failed at fundraising and I learned a lot, which I applied very successfully to my next venture. And we failed at hiring um, key talent. And I'd say specifically around monetization, uh, just as a business, we just were, we were too shy about charging for what we had done. And that was unfortunate. So learned a lot about other parts of business construction. Again, most of these lessons are the hard way. Proxlet was a side project with a friend where we got together and said, wouldn't it be great if Twitter could fricking mute things. And so we built this API proxy that you could point your Twitter browser experience through this proxy and it would do all this munging of things, remove ads, remove keywords, do translation. It was really cool and ultimately got shut down. 
I solved a lot of the, are people using it? Am I able to get feedback and iterate it to make them better? But they weren't necessarily sound businesses, you know, end to end. And, and that one taught me platform risk like no other thing ever had. So very important lesson in there. Be careful who you build on top of, because if you have that kind of dependency, you can be snuffed out overnight and there's not much you can do about it. So Boundless was a really bold venture play. We're going to make textbooks obsolete for college students. You can learn anything online. Don't be buying those textbooks. The market did not want what we were selling. Did the bigger players like push back pretty hard? Oh, or? The bigger players sued us. That was a fun Series A announcement. <laughs> hey, world, we've yeah. got a lot of money to build with, and also we're under uh, we're under attack. Oh, geez. Yeah, you know the the, the you can look at the the stats of how the price of textbooks have outpaced inflation for years and years and years. It's really gross and embarrassing. Uh, it's hard. I mean, if you're a student and you're just trying to afford going to school and you're just paying for an 11th edition that has like five changes from the 10th edition, it doesn't make sense. The, the problem was mm -hmm. there are two groups of students. Those who take their education so seriously, they will not deviate from the assigned prescription of what they should be doing, in this case, buying textbooks. And those students probably have loans, which actually weirdly, not weirdly, makes them less price sensitive. And then you got the other end of students, which just don't give a shit. And they would use sites like, you know, these kind of uh, answer sharing sites. And that's all they cared about. And we didn't want to become that. I felt really queasy with the idea that, hey, we could attract a large audience if we published answers to textbooks, but that's not a business to me. That didn't go the way we hoped. We did exit it. It was very close to um, dollars in. And we actually had two suitors, one that had put a million bucks in my pocket, you know, before my, my thirties and the other one that would return just money to our investors. And unfortunately it, it went that way, but it was so close at the time. And that lesson was no deals done until it's done. Like until everything's signed and cash is in the bank, you should be on your vigil because it's just not real. And that lesson was very helpful for the rest of my career. Um, I've seen so many things go wrong. I feel like that's true for partnership deals, joint ventures, but especially when going to market, it's like no deal is more than 60% likely to go through. And it's like having that mindset that even if this deal doesn't work out, I'm still running a profitable business. I'm still scaling whether this happens or not. Like I'm not going to put all my eggs in that basket. Your equity always value it at zero full stop. I, I, I will never play a game where, you know, unrealized private equity there's no value in it. Don't kid yourself. It, it could blow up, even no matter how successful you are, it could blow up overnight. Don't count your chickens until they've hatched. Um, and that's that's been grounding in the most real ways ever since then. The idea though is like, I'm doing this. Like this is my path. If you want to join, great. If not, that's also fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like time, I like that approach also with running a company and fundraising too, because it's like, I'm going to be running this company. It's going to be bootstrapped and profitable. It's going to look good, right? And I could take your money or I, I'm okay not. And they can kind of tell. They're like, this guy is okay and I kind of want to be involved in this. That was you know, how we failed, I think, at fundraising for the art company. We just sort of had this, we need your permission vibe to ourselves while fundraising. And I don't think we believed it deep down, but that's how we presented when we fundraise for the textbook company and then you know every company thereafter was here's the big vision here's the traction you're welcome to get on this bus you know but we're not we don't need your your superlative permission or deep insight to validate what we're doing that's that's it's the, you've reversed the direction of power unhealthily if that's your approach to it also having that scar tissue built up you know you have that deal experience you're comfortable talking about the different terms you know what you want whenever you're going into it, it helps the one thing I say to that audience as well is adulthood is an illusion only children can see, which is to say that if you think someone else knows more than you do, like, oh, you're going to go meet the guru who's going to drop the, you know, the, the the universe's truths on your head, that person doesn't exist. Everybody's making it up as they go along, even the seasoned folks. You'll present, you know, the best entrepreneur in the world, maybe a billionaire, your idea, they'll give you feedback. There's some chance there's good feedback, but there's a great chance it's really crappy feedback because they just don't understand your market or they don't understand the new tech so it's just hard you just got to keep taking shots on goal tell me about the two that that worked out tell me about uh blissfully and tell me about profit well because those 
those were longer journeys too. They weren't, they didn't happen overnight. What did you say? Your journeys with very <laughs> meaningful, yeah, very meaningful exits. Yeah. So I'll start with, with, with ProfitWell, which was originally called Price Intelligently. And that was born of a set of weekends that my high school friend, Christopher O'Donnell, who went on to become the chief product officer at HubSpot. And we would get together on the weekends when his wife was out of town and we would just bang out a product. It didn't matter what it was. We would just bang something out. And then on Monday, we'd try to sell it. And we repeated this a number of times. After a few repetitions, we were saying, well, how the hell do you price software? Cost of goods is negligible. Like, what, what do you do? Finger to the wind? And we found a couple of these different pricing techniques, Van Westendorp, price sensitivity analysis, discrete choice modeling, things like that. And we came up with this survey tool that would help people survey their audience or their intended audience to figure out optimal pricing. We put it together. We sold it on a weekend. What we found was there was a ton of interest, but it was very, very hard for people to run this software on their own. So it needed to be more like a, a consultancy, a services business where we would conduct it on your behalf. And we met up with Patrick Campbell, who was then at Gemvara doing pricing. He was at NASA doing a bunch of deep security analysis. And he was so brilliant. And we're like, dude, this thing is made for you. This is clearly not something that we would nearly do as well as if you had this. And he took the business and he ran with it. And so Christopher and I became board members, tried to help. Uh, Patrick brought such incredible superpowers to this thing that honestly, I mean, I mean, he was CEO and he is the face of the whole thing and he deserves 99.999% of the credit. Your pricing module is probably the other thing. It's very easy to change if you price right, it flows straight down to your bottom line. Like that's a no brainer. So how did you take it to market? It, it's a no brainer in so many different ways because people might churn due to a bad pricing model. They might fail to sign up doing the pricing model. You might not capture success in tandem with them, which is sort of an ongoing misprice. And frankly, most people just underprice, period, which means you're leaving a lot on the table and actually narrowing your ability to go to market effectively. There's, there's a lot of different ways pricing is central to success for an organization. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs get funny with the money early on and, and don't tinker with it and don't try to align it. You know, if you're a first time entrepreneur, it's just you're sometimes you're just grateful that people are paying you, honestly. I was talking to Andrew Warner in the first podcast episode, and we were talking about permission to receive money. It's like, hey, can we please like, thank you so much. Like you're, you're almost nervous to accept, um, payment and we normally price too low and there's a value associated with, um, price. So if you price higher, people are going to be more involved and more engaged and it gives you more leeway to provide a better service. So I'm, I'm on board with that for sure. If you're making a great product, I don't want to say your customers are lucky to be working with you because you do have to cherish them. That's that that's probably over tilting, but it's not, oh, please give me money and my God, am I thankful you did? Like that that's people can smell that and you know, it's not it's not good for your psychology and it's not good for their perception either. Hey podcast listeners, I made operator equity as a place for entrepreneurs to invest and buy in other entrepreneur led businesses. If you guys are interested in uh, learning more and possibly buying a business, or if you're interested in possibly selling your business to other entrepreneurs that have sold their business in the past, please reach out to operatorequity.com. I'm really excited about this new project, and I think that entrepreneurs should be buying more businesses. So if this resonates with you, check it out. Bye. There's this trend around community building and like launching. It used to be there. It's only like EO and YPO, and they've been around forever. Now there's communities for subsets of groups, and some of them are paid and some of them are not paid. And we're part of some of them that are free and some of them that are paid. And I was wondering about what your thoughts were from a pricing perspective about value creation inside a community and how that should, how that's going to change probably in the next, I don't know, a couple of years as things get more saturated. Here's my thesis. I think paid communities are great. And I think they're only going to go up in terms of their value to not just their groups, but society at large. We're entering a phase now where AI can generate plausible human content at scale and dirt cheap. And it's going to saturate every medium, text, email, voice calls, your Reddit forums. I mean, it's already doing this stuff, you know, X, LinkedIn, you name it, wherever you see humans participate, if there's not a cost to be in that community, AI is going to flood it. And you can kind of smell it as spam now, 
but I think that's going to go away. Like these models are getting better and better. So I was joking, like, let's say there's that one, the Hamptons, right? Which I think, you know, you also, you know, are aware of maybe, the, I don't know what that community charges or if it charges anything, but let's assume there's some community out there for well-to-do folks that charges, you know, $20,000 a year, kind of like a, you know, a, a country club. Well, AI might still join that because if it can come in and befriend rich people over three months and say, hey, I'm just like you and you have meaningful conversations with it. And then on month three, it says, by the way, I sell private planes. Do you want to buy a jet? If enough people bite at that, it's economically viable to flood all the rich person pay to join communities with AI. So I share all this because I think that paid communities are going to be a necessary gate to keep out the hordes of spam AI. So whether on the merits or not, they mattered pre-AI, I think they're actually fundamentally necessary post-AI. And that's just something I think about all the time. I like your apocalyptic saying that is a (laughs) really hard word to say. I think that take is is pretty fresh because it's like, it's easier to build a website and the website used to be the marker of credibility. It's like, do you have a website that's a check? Is it a good website? That's like a double check, right? And it's easier to make that. It's easier to generate blog content. And so where's the barrier? Like there's no barrier. There, there's none. You know, and this is why people are thinking Google's in trouble because they're, you know, search is being attacked. SEO is under threat from AI. Advertising model might follow. You know, websites, page rank used to be the network of proof that you had value. If enough people link to your site, that's like saying, hey, you know, I'm Connor's website's buddy. I believe in it. Like, okay, well, now that thing has cachet. Well, if that goes away, then communities... And networks like that are the way to say, hey, I believe in this person and what they say. So you're following on X or you're following on LinkedIn or your private community. Those matter so, so much more. And I think it's only going to keep rising. So it's a very smart way to build companies these days. And I know there's a whole movement around community first, product second. There's a lot of there's a lot of merit. In that. Let's talk a little bit about company culture stuff, because I know that's one of the things that we want to talk about. So you had a lot of remote employees. Um we also navigate something similar where we had to build like a uh, remote company culture, philanthropy in different cities, like social activities that are happening online. How did you navigate a remote uh, company culture? The way in which we created a great culture was almost by accident. I had hired a new engineer and she was very nervous about making sure she was doing her job well. And she wanted to get a lot of feedback, which is awesome. I I love it. And so she said, would it be okay if I just started kind of tweeting out my Slack channel, what the hell I'm up to? And I said, yeah. So she started live blogging her day in Slack and I would give constant feedback around what she was tweeting, er, tweeting, slacking. And what was amazing was other people in the company started jumping in to help, right? They would say, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Thanks. I just learned from you. Or, oh, let me save you eight hours of time. Don't go down that path. Do, you know, try this instead. And it, it just was like this, like my, my, that it just clicked in my head. Immediately we have active presence for people all day long. You're educating your peers. You are not wasting time between standups. You're not gonna spend eight hours stuck in something. Someone's going to jump in and help you. And we scaled that culture up to 150 people in a product design and engineering team who are all live blogging their days constantly. It's a ton of content. Don't get me wrong. You can get lost in in that content, but our cycle time was so, so fast. No one had to wait to the next day. And it was just remarkable. You know, it scared a lot of people. I would disclose this in the hiring process. We're the kind of company that doesn't want to wait. If you're stuck, we want to know right away. So we hire people who are intellectually vulnerable and will participate in this culture. If it's not for you, that's okay. We don't need you to solve problems uniquely to be successful here. We need you to help the team. Like we need to be globally optimized. So if you're stuck, just talk about it. Half the time when you write something out loud, you solve it yourself. And the other half of the time, your team jumps in and solves it with you. And then you're not wasting another day cycle on this thing. And there's something too, like your job probably changed, like where you were initially building stuff and solving stuff on your own. There's a visibility that you're providing and a, uh, almost like a consistency and like company culture. So by you posting consistently, people feel like they're aligned, that you understand what problems the company is facing. You know, the magic of in person is you feel the energy of other people building. I think this is this, this, you know, I don't want to compare and contrast, but this provided that in the digital space. It also created that I know what's going on feeling. You know, it's sort of the ultimate transparency. You don't have to 
to think, oh, I've never talked to this person, this other team, they must be screwing me over deliberately. It's like, go look at their channel. You can see what they're struggling with, what they're thinking about, why they're gummed up. And that would allow managers to get together and do global optimization on the system. So I, I, you know, I can't sing enough praises here. I thought it was truly a fantastic culture we built. I like these things that spun organically. Like for us, we had special interest groups where it's like employee-led employee engagement. So they're like, I'm passionate about this thing. I'm going to lead this group. And because we had thousands of people, we had to have a culture that was from like everyone was engaged in it. Everyone was making it. It had to be decentralized essentially. So like part of their onboarding was like, what do you want to join? Like, do you want to be involved in philanthropy? Do you want to be involved in, I think one of the biggest ones was anime and manga. And it was just like gifts of like <laughs> anime episodes. And there's I'd thousands of them. Attack on Titan for life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it was the most active group. And I love that stuff. I got a lot of inspiration for this from the indie builders on Twitter. So I, if someone launches, I told you earlier, if, if people who launch products, I have a, like so much love and respect for them. So people launching their first SaaS product ever, if I see that on Twitter, you might get a follow from me in your, you know, in your follower uh, notifications. And watching people just build in public like that, I learned stuff. You know, I learned so much stuff and it increases my rate of learning. And so just porting that into the company culture was pretty awesome. The other thing is, even as a leader inside your company, verbalizing what you're struggling with and thinking about can often elicit a ton of interesting insights you know, obviously there's a sensitive line on certain things you might be thinking about or not, but there's a lot of times you're like, Hey, I just don't know how this feature is going to evolve. These are my concerns. And you might have people from random corners of the company jumping in with deep insights saying, have you thought about this? And going, no, I'm so glad you're on the team. Thanks for helping out with this. I think that's a pretty powerful thing. If you can be a, a CEO or be a founder and be vulnerable and, and share what's happening. And, and I found as a manager, that vulnerability goes a long way to truly creating the right type of relationship between you and the folks that you work with. It's it just, again, adulthood is an illusion. I, I don't want to seem like I have the answers because that's going to turn you off from raising problems or solutions to me. And then we all fail together. I'd rather win together because I told you I didn't know stuff and you helped out or you didn't either. And you know, we just keep grinding away, but that's, that's sort of the only way to fly in my book. Aaron, I wanted to ask you about the two exits. So how did you run that process? Where were you at in your life? Working out of a basement. Um, <laughs> so for price intelligently, um, which was then became profit. Well, the process, it, it, it took a little while to get going. Um, the business was self-sustaining and growing. I, I mean, to be clear, it didn't need necessarily to sell. But as a management, or sorry, as a you know, a board, we got together and just had a number of discussions around the way the ecosystem was evolving, and that there were probably some one plus one equals three opportunities out there, and we should go figure out what they are before we commit to new paths that may or may not succeed, but would fundamentally alter the business forever. Right? There's new projects we could do. Maybe it takes raising money. Maybe it takes jettisoning old things. You know, what's our level of conviction? What are the opportunities to do greater things with someone else combined? And, you know, that that started as a kind of mm -hmm. talk to a few people here and there, and then ultimately became an actual process where 10 to 12 people were engaged simultaneously. Um, for me, I got to advise that one from afar in the sense that I was, you know, a, a non-operating board member co-founder on this, trying to help make this thing work and giving advice and and trying to keep all the parties, you know, happy and enthused and keep our psychology duct taped together because it's really taxing, even when you're not in it. You know, you can talk to Patrick and he can tell you, you know, because he was running it firsthand, how insanely challenging that was emotionally for him. And then the, the Blissfully acquisition, that one's, you know, I have a lot more thoughts on that because we were growing, but we weren't growing like bonkers. If you're in a venture back startup game, You've got a you've got a clock, right? And until you hit that that you know escape velocity of enough customers to eclipse your costs, you really have to understand: are you going to be able to fundraise more money or not? And we were in a situation where we had built too much, customers valued different things, and so our growth prospects probably required a little bit of a reset on the product. We needed to narrow the product to expand growth, which is counterintuitive, but it's the right way to do it. And that's a lesson I've learned the hard way several times. 
So with that acquisition by vendor, they were really looking for a certain type of, you know, technology, technology team, um, SaaS catalog and all this stuff. So that was a real one plus one equals three because they got exactly what they needed in the team that could build and grow that. And we got to jettison parts of the product that were going to hold hold us back, whether it was on our own opportunity or theirs. And in fact, it was such a great story that I think it was six months after acquisition, maybe even less, uh, I went out, the CEO, the CFO, and myself, and we fundraised $150 million Series B. So, you know, that was a pretty crazy journey. But that that process of, of exiting was just so complicated because we were trying to suss out our own runway, our own ability to raise money, this one plus one equals three equation. But once you see what could be, it's hard to unsee it. Like that just made so much sense. It was hard not to go through with it. But even when all parties want a deal to happen, it can still fall apart. It's still ex- incredibly painful and nerve wracking. It's like showing up to this party that everybody should be so excited, but you're just so defeated. And that it's fe- feels so surreal also at the same time. So like when cash flowed into my account, it was like hard to, I'm like looking at it, I'm like, is that? It's anticlimactic, right? Yeah, it's anticlimactic. Yeah. So there's like a couple moments that I think happen. Like one is like you're on the legal call and everyone says like, yep, yep, yep. And you go around the table and everyone gives a thumbs up. And then the other is like waiting either in a bank or on your phone for the wire transfer to go yeah, When's that wire going to land? <laughs> yeah. And there's no like champagne or like celebration or anything like that unless you do, unless you plan it. And this was during COVID time still. Yeah. So there was no like, hey, let's get together and celebrate and all. We didn't get together. We still haven't, uh, you know, years later. And uh, it sucks. That's a, that's, that's, that's a, a little bit of a negative for building in the remote world, whether it was by choice or forced on you. I, I, I was calling the banker and broker probably several times. Oh, well, they were calling me actually several times a day. And I was talking to my co-founders like nonstop like navigating the different deal terms and making sure that everything was square. And then once the deal closes, it's like quiet. It's like, but then you have a whole bunch of work you have to do. You have to make sure that the employee experience is good. That the transition plan like goes smoothly. How did you guys kind of work that? As nerve wracking and anticlimactic at the same time that the, 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 the legal and sale process was integrating team cultures afterwards on the blissfully, the vendor side of things was, just the most challenging thing to do because and and for no one's fault let me just be clear here like i just it's just hard to smash cultures up together they have their own culture they had their own tech stack it was different you know how do you tell people things are going to change in ways that they probably didn't sign up for they definitely didn't sign up for they may not agree with often i felt like darth vader like i was coming in and, and just killing things that people valued and forcing my will on stuff and for what it's worth, of course, I think I'm this very empathetic, transparent, vulnerable person. People listening to this who've worked, they feel free to disagree and shoot me <laughs> snide comments. In the comments, um, yeah. You have to make a lot of hard calls. I mean, I think entrepreneurs know this, but saying no is usually more important than saying yes. Um, and what we said no to really mattered. And the speed at which you can say no and move forward matters a ton. In order to make culture work, you have to get up close and personal with folks and you're probably going to get hurt. Even if you see the logic in it, you're still going to just bristle and feel uncomfortable. But that's what it takes to to make a culture work is sort of being clear about what you're not going to do, uh, being transparent and being swift with it. Because the longer you let things linger in the in-between land, you've got portions of your company that are kind of separating and you may not realize it. I think something that you do really well is, is probably communicate or over communicate. So I imagine that's helpful with the exit process because ambiguity hurts. Ambiguity kills. The thing that hurt me early on with that was I wanted to be respectful that our culture was coming into an existing culture. And so I didn't want to overplay my thoughts. I wanted to make sure that I really had absorbed the culture and the vibe of the company I think I had mixed results with that, frankly. Like, it's a hard thing to do because I also want to move at warp speed. Like, hey, we got this combined opportunity. Let's go, 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 go. Right. I want to touch on uh, really quickly, how is life for you now? And what are some things that you're excited about? What's exciting for me right now is that the world is changing so fast and AI is evolving so fast. I don't think much of what we do today is going to look the same in 10 years. 
uh, at least in the software space. I think it's going to be fairly dramatic. And I am very excited to be a part of that because I am a technologist, I'm a product builder, and I love culture and science fiction. And all of that has come together in this kind of new era we're heading into. So I could not be more jazzed. But setting aside my startup ambitions, because I am not done, like there's a lot more I want to do. Life has been pretty good because I've been focusing on my health, which has taken a huge toll over the last couple of years. And it's no one's fault. It's just Look, if you've got something huge you're pursuing and you're merging cultures and you're merging products, like I, I'm going to burn the candle at both ends. And having the headspace to think deeply about things cannot be uh, overrated. I think if you're a leader at a company, and, and you probably do this, finding time to get away to think deeply from your business is where some of the most transformative ideas come from. And anybody in the business could provide those. But when you're in the thick of it, operating, 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 it's easy to get lost in the drama of the day or the micro opportunity or whatever you know thing you're trying to solve. I've had now a couple months of just thinking, and that's been awesome. I spend too much time with myself recently, and I'm trying to spend some <laughs> more time with other people. That's been great. Like so, focusing more on like uh, relationships. And I think I had my head down so much just to poke it out and start talking to other entrepreneurs about what makes them excited and and uh, learn about other things. That have you have you found that helpful for you to clarify what's been stewing around in your own uh, in your yeah, own? Mind? I wish I didn't wait. Like I know that like as a CEO running right. a company, you have 14, 18 meetings a day, but like it's so valuable to connect with other folks. I I wish I was doing it earlier. When my calendar went from fully packed to nothing. Any request for meeting that came in, I would just take because I felt uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm like, I know my, my day can't be empty. I need something on it. Fill the calendar. So actually for the first couple of weeks, I actually did have a packed calendar. And then I caught myself going, what the hell are you doing, dude? Like this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. You shouldn't be doing this it's right now. It's a little now. sad that our happiness is dependent on, on digital meetings on Zoom and meeting with random people. <laughs> um, but I think in a way that like post exit founders is helpful because then you're just meeting with other people going through some more stuff. It's, it's helpful to kind of reconnect on that. Right. You go to a networking event or something. Oh, who are you and what do you do or what have you done? And then, you know, I know it's like a trope. People might hear you and then move on to the next person if it's not interesting enough right and, and and i'm not judging that but but i think when you spend all your time in that space and you exit it and you go to a dinner party and say what are you doing i'm like Meh. i'm just i take walk if you take an hour-long walk around an island with my wife every morning like honestly that was the highlight of my day for a long yeah. while it's awesome still is yeah um, it's not a conversation at dinner that people get excited yeah. about but hey i feel great. yeah so, i mean this fantasy nice. book it's fantastic or like you know, it's just, <laughs> in a way, I'm kind of enjoying that. Like whenever someone asks me what I do, I just change the answer every time because it's a different answer. Like I'm, I'm doing something different, That's right? Well, I really appreciate the chat. Um, Aaron, do you have a place where you want people to find you if they want to reach out or, or connect with you? I'm, I'm, I'm most active on Twitter, mm -hmm. x.com forward slash Aaron White. That's fantastic. Um, Aaron, so good to have you on the pod. I appreciate the chat and uh, we'll be in touch. Connor, thank you so much. This is awesome. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more episodes on navigating the thrilling path of entrepreneurship.